Coming up, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I can tell you with great integrity that the president doesn't consider disagreement disloyalty, at least for me. General Martin Dempsey discusses ISIS, the job of the general, and the values of the world's largest military. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's a distinct honor for me to interview General Dempsey. He served in the United States Army since 1974, commissioned in armor, served a lot of time in cavalry units, 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment in Germany, commanded the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, commanded the 1st Armored Division in Iraq, and you know subsequently moved on to being the acting commander of CENTCOM, the director of our Training and Doctrine Command, which he attempted to invigorate how we think about this strange complexity of warfare in the 21st century prior to becoming the Chief of Staff of the Army and subsequently the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Again, sir, an honor and pleasure. It's good to see you. You know, the focal point of the Council currently is, of course, that interrelationship between ethics and international affairs. With this in mind, military leaders and yourself speak frequently about the professional military ethic. Can, can you explain this audience briefly what that is and why that is particularly crucial to the military profession? You know, a, any profession, before I zero in on the military profession, has to, you're not a profession just because you say you are, right? Although some people do that. We, we throw the term professional around kind of loosely. But to, be, to truly be a professional, you have to have some particular skills and expertise. Ours is, the, I'll call it, to use a Huntington phrase, um, the management of violence. We disperse violence on behalf of the nation. Well, that's a pretty tall order, right? So it takes an incredibly skilled and, and expert population to do that. But to do it responsibly requires the next step, which is a, a professional ethos, a set of behaviors that allow you to live a life uh, against a set of values. And if, and if we don't have those two things together, if you have a military profession that is charged with and has the sacred trust of the nation to use violence responsibly, because that's the way we as a nation believe violence you know, should be used responsibly. And then if you don't have that, that professional ethos to, under, to provide the foundation for, the, for, for dispersing violence, we'd be in a much different place, not only as a military, but as a nation. So that's why it's so important. And then there's other things, you know, a commitment to continuing education, both structured and self-developmental. I mean, there's a list of about six or seven things that provide for us the metric to allow us to measure whether we're actually living up to the title of profession. I think we both agree the military right now enjoys, by any popularity poll, the great, you know, great affection of the American people is held in very high esteem. But there's been challenge to that of late. There's been real concerns. You've voiced some. We've seen senior officers over the last several years relieve for issues having to do with sexual harassment, relieved over issues having to do with alcohol, relieved for cheating on examinations. Does that concern you? Is it perhaps a manifestation of you know, 13 years of combat that this particular force has been under undergoing? Or is it merely a reflection that we live in a much more transparent society where you know, there's a 24-7 news cycle, so those people who are doing what you just said are held in higher scrutiny? Mm. Yes. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me unpack the yes a little bit here. I think, so all those things are factors. Um, I think but for me, anyway, and when I discussed this with our senior uh, officers and non-commissioned officers, it wasn't the last 13 years of conflict. It wasn't the crucible of war that caused us to become a, a bit indisciplined, let's call it that, but rather that the pace prevented us from actually being reflective and going into environments continuing education. Remember, one of the things I said that marks any profession is a commitment to continuing education, to development over time. And the military has had, since I've been in it, since you were in it, has had a very um, predictable and structured series of educational opportunities placed at important points along the way so that you could get out of the maelstrom, if you will, of day-to-day -day activity go into a more or less academic environment 
uh, among your peers and sometimes with international students and interagency partners from other, from other departments of the United States government and argue about things. What happened over time is we got so busy from 2000 roughly three to about 2010 that we went from a, a, a profession that valued education, that time spent in education was valuable, was rewarded by promotion and by selection for command, to a point where we undervalued it for a period, where you know if you were a major serving in my division and you had a choice to go either to the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, or stay and be the Deputy Director of Operations for the division, all of your mentors would have said, stay in the fight, stay right here, stay with the day-to-day, -day because that's what's going to be rewarded. And they were right. The promotion board started rewarding time in Iraq, time in Afghanistan, more than they valued you know, time spent teaching at West Point. So, then we went from undervaluing it to devaluing it, where education for a period of time actually became a negative. In other words, you know, you, you've gone to school, you must not be committed to the tempo. Well, when I became the commander of training and doctrine command, subsequently chief staff of the army, we put some teeth, if you will, back into our policy to make sure that you couldn't get promoted, you couldn't get selected for command unless you went through these educational experiences. And it's in those educational experiences where you learn the theory of ethics, right, and behaviors. And then you go out and practice it. But if you don't first learn the theory, you're out there and you don't have the tools, you know, to measure yourself against what it means to be part of this profession. That was the single biggest factor. But the other things you mentioned are clearly a case, part of the, part of the issue as well. You know, the ubiquitous presence of the media. You can't blame the media for it. I mean, you know, if, if you're well-behaved, the media can see you being well-behaved as well as it can see you being in this. They made a report on it, though. But. Yeah, 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 that's true. And by the way, last but not least, we, we are a profession of human beings. And, you know, the, you're never going to have 100% of any population act consistently. The important thing is that uh, you hold people accountable when it's necessary to do so. And actually, we got a little sloppy about that in the last 10 or 12 years. Why? Well, look, see this right here? You know, you, you have someone who does something and you say, wow, you know what, though? He's really been hard at it, and maybe we ought to give him a break. Now, I'm not against, you know, being compassionate in the dispersal of accountability and justice, but you have to understand that over time, too much compassion in, in, the, in, the dis, in the dispersion of discipline can lead to a new standard. And I think our standards had got a little low. But by the way, we're back. You won't see us in the news. Uh, and when you do, it'll be for holding people accountable, not for being surprised. There's no doubt about it that we're embroiled in very complex conflicts in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. How does a senior leader in that really unbelievable environment strike a balance between questions of ethics and questions of morality, particularly confronted by this heinous enemy of ours, with the need to work together with other allies and, and other institutions in prosecuting a clear strategy? No, it's a great question. And in some level, the military in particular is kind of, a, we're kind of a victim of our own success, maybe, in the sense that, you know, people will suggest that we, we, we certainly must be able to see things near real time, and that if we chose to do something about it, we could. The reason we've gone back into Baghdad and into Erbil and into Iraq in general is that we've identified this group, which has actually separated itself from other groups that we already thought were dangerous and evil and ideologically you know, antithetical to everything we believe in. This group had actually separated itself from that, and so they were, uh, you know, clearly uh, something that had to be uh, dealt with. Um, in so doing, though, we adopted a strategy that said that we would do this through um, credible partners, ground partners in the region, notably, at, at least initially, with the Iraqi security forces, the Peshmerga. We will, at some point, uh, enlist the support of the tribes. And we built a kind of remarkable coalition, actually. You know, I've been in this a long time, and there's some nations in this coalition that if you had told me a year ago we could bring them into a coalition, I'd say, I don't think so. You're not going to get them in. So the coalition is sound. 
as you've alluded to, though, the coalition is, you know, if it's if there are you know 22, I think nations. Uh, who are contributing in some way to either the support of military operations or military operations itself. That means you have 22 different sets of agendas, right? Uh, and in that part of the world, of course, clarity is not exactly a word you would ever assign to the Middle East. <laughs> and so these 23 agendas play out in this kind of opaque environment. And the point of all that is, it, it requires a certain strategic patience so that you, um, you first do no harm in trying to maintain the coalition and at the same time deliberately build enough of a credible indigenous force that can overcome this group called ISIL or ISIS or Daesh, depending on how you describe it. So something like Kobani pops up and the demand signal is, you know, you have to stop the, the slaughter or Sinjar Mountain. And in some cases, we're able to do that. In other cases, the issue is so, north of Aleppo right now is just almost, it's a Rubik's Cube, frankly. And the more you try, it's, it's like the Heisenberg Principle. Every time you touch it, it changes. And you, you know, you have something new to consider. So th this, is, this is a case of staying true to the to the principle that we will, over time, defeat ISIL. And we'll do it through regional actors, not despite regional actors. And there's going to be cases where, there are, where ISIL will have tactical success. But if we're true to the principle, then over time, um, we believe we can, we can defeat ISIL with them. And by the way, ISIL will only be, ISIL's not going to be, you know this, ISIL is not going to be defeated um, with the, solely with the military instrument of power. What will cause ISIL to be defeated ultimately is that the Sunni population, 20 million Sunni between Damascus and Baghdad, disenfranchised. They don't have a government in which they, tr that they trust or believe in. Until that changes, and then we supply the military pressure to build time into the strategy so that the government of Iraq can reconcile with the Sunni population and with the, uh, and with the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish population, and find some credible partner in Syria. That's what will happen, is that those populations will ultimately reject this radical ideology with us in support. But every time we leap over that principle and take charge of something ourselves, we actually, at some level, set back the strategy a bit. And so it's really a delicate, it is, it's a balancing act between the horror of watching um, the atrocities that this group is willing to commit, and at the same time, doing what we can to stay true to the strategy. And again, back to the media. The me See, this is one of those cases where you know, the media will flock to a p particular position. I'm not being critical. I mean, they'll flock to where the the story is most sensational, and it can, it can tug you in ways that are not all that helpful. Let me move on, and let's talk about the, your role as the, you know, the, you are the senior military advisor to the President of the United States. So you sit at that pinnacle of the, the civil military relations problem in, a, in our democracy. Can you kind of talk about the challenges of that particular position in civil military relations of advising the President while at the same time being, if you need, need to be a team player, in this you know, democratic society that we hold so dear. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have chosen team player. I, that's not one but that I perhaps, would like. Perhaps, yeah. You know what I mean? What, what, I, what I would say is, first of all, a couple of things. Um, I've got to um, be able to be candid and provide my advice to the president, to the SECDEF, to the National Security Council, and to the president of the United States. And disagreement isn't disloyalty. Now, and by the way, I can tell you, with great integrity that the president doesn't consider disagreement disloyalty, at least for me. One of the things I told the president is I'll never communicate with you through the media. That's that, fine. But that's, that's fine. fair, right? I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't be communicating with, you know, I shouldn't be here. I mean, there you are. Hello. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to, if, if I haven't had a conversation with the president and he hasn't made a decision, I'm not going to talk about it. And if I've given him my advice and he's still deciding whether to take it or not, I'm not going to talk about it. Once he does, and he, if he takes my advice, that's fine. I mean, he's the president. If he doesn't take my advice, that's also fine. But I've got to be able to say when asked in testimony before Congress, because I also have responsibilities by the Constitution to maintain a relationship with the Congress and to inform them on strategy. 
I've got to be able to say when somebody says, did you give advice to the president? Yes, I did. Did he take it? No, he didn't. Well, why didn't he take it? I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> but here's the other thing you've got to know. Um, the one thing I have learned, I, I'm, I'm a different chairman than I was three years ago, frankly. I, I, don't, I didn't know it at the time, but I know it looking back. One of the things that I think that the military owes all of its senior elected officials is uh, options, not ultimatums. In other words, there's not just one way to accomplish anything. And by the way, one of the principles of military leadership is never let the boss run out of options. So I think that's true of, by the way, it doesn't have to be military leadership. I think it's a principle of leadership that you should always seek to never cause the decision maker to run out of options. Does it happen on occasion? Yeah, it does. But your, your approach should be always to find options. And then my other responsibility is, when providing those options, to articulate risk. So here's a high risk option. Here's a moderate risk option. Here's a low risk option. Which one do you recommend? Low. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm the military guy. But then when the other uh, factors are put in there, you might find the decision goes to moderate or high risk. And that's the way the, that's the, way the, the system is actually designed. It's, in this format, I can explain that to you. You know, that it's not about confronting the president with an either or proposition. Either do it my way or it's going to fail. It's more about, with any president, by the way, and I've worked for three of them now, it's more about, first of all, coming to some common understanding of the problem. We drive to the solution sometimes, all of us, before we really understand the problem. You know, you, you probably know this because you taught social science at West Point, but Einstein had a great saying, if you, if you only have an hour to save the world, spend 55 minutes of it understanding the problem and five minutes solving it. And I'm telling you, that is absolutely true today. So my first obligation is make sure we have a common understanding of the problem. The second is to provide options. And the third is to articulate risk. Our elected officials in our system of government make a decision. You will never, I hope, while I'm chairman, hear anyone say, this is Dempsey's strategy. Dempsey doesn't have, I'm not the, I don't make that decision. This is the, the strategy of the United States government in which I have had a role in shaping and advising. Thank you very much, General Dempsey. Guillermo Roshinsky, Canadian Ambassador to the United Nations. In your judgment, do you think that the rest of the world understands the gravity of the threats that currently exist and are making the appropriate kind of investments and orientation to deal with them to be able to act as collaborators with the United States Armed Forces? Or is the kind of attitude that we've seen pervasive over the course of the last decade that if there's a problem, get the U.S. to take care of it and the problem will go away? Let me speak about the, the collaboration that we, we do among military leaders, um, recognizing, as I say this, that the military advice to our, you know, Tom Lawson's advice to your prime minister or Nick Houghton's advice to Prime Minister Cameron or whoever it happens to be, is not always treated with the same sense of urgency that, that uh, maybe the military leaders would like. And I'm, by the way, I'm not, Tom has never said that to me, but I'm just suggesting to you that um, at the military level, we actually have those kind of conversations frequently. Let me say this about whether the world is alert to its challenges. So this is grossly simplistic, but it'll, it, it'll work for, the, for this moment in time. When I look at the security issues facing the globe, you've got some that are related to state actors. So you've got you know, a rising China. And, and by the way, I'm not one that thinks that a confrontation with China is inevitable. I actually think the opposite. But anyway, you've got a rising China, and that state actor is creating discomfort in its territorial disputes and in its competition, frankly, um, within the, the Asia-Pacific sphere. OK, then you've got a, an assertive Russia. And I think that actually surprised Europe, frankly. I mean, I think Europe is kind of awakened slowly, but is awakening, maybe, present participle, awakening to the, what Russia could really mean. And it may not be a direct confrontation with Russia, hopefully will not mean that, but it could mean that this kind of flame of nationalism that has been lit in ethnicity could actually create 
a security situation that, that would surprise all of us in Europe. So to the extent that our military leaders are alert to state-on-state -state issues, I'd say with a pretty high degree of confidence that we get it. We understand their capabilities, our capabilities, where there are gaps, where we can complement each other. I have a, um, I've picked out five allies with whom I have a, uh, a special kind of relationship in terms of our um, not only interoperability, but at some level interdependence, and that would be um, Canada and Mexico, because those are our near neighbors, and the um, United Kingdom, uh, Israel, uh, Australia, and Japan. And I, was that five or six? I forget. But anyway, whatever the number is, that's the number. And those have been incredible sessions, actually, to kind of uh, share a common strategic vision and then to kind of help try to help figure out what it would take to achieve it. Where we kind of you know, all of us kind of um, um, stagger a bit is in trying to understand um, the inherent instability and weakness of the Middle East. Because the military instrument makes sense when you talk about it in terms of state-on-state -state actors, right? You know, we have, a, we have a long body of knowledge that says, if I do this, the adversary is likely to do that. And if they do this, I, I can do this. And, and so you've got, um, you know, we have a common frame of reference in dealing with state on state. We know what deterrence means. We, you know, we know what assurance means. And we know what preparedness means. And we know what, you know, contingency planning means and phases of operations and setting theaters. You know, when you're talking about the abject fragility of the Middle East, application of the military instrument of power becomes far more complex. It's as I described it in other settings. I may have even used it earlier here. It's, 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 uh, it's the difference between complicated and complex. If something's complicated, you can unpack it, take the pieces, fix the pieces, put it back together, and it's better. If something's complex and you unpack it, as soon as you touch it, you change it. And as soon as you change it, you got to go back and try to figure it out again. And that's what the Middle East is like. And using the military instrument of power in a complex environment against inherent weakness, not strength on strength. It's not me measuring my military capability against China or me measuring my military capability against Russia. It's me with my incredible military instrument of power trying to figure out how to apply something that strong to something that weak and not change it in ways that would be counter to the outcome we're trying to produce. So on that issue, you know, the Middle East and these groups that stretch from you know, the Fatah all the way over to Nigeria. You know, we, we are all actually all struggling to determine what our role should be and how we enable regional actors with the capabilities we have. But yeah, we've got a very close collaboration. And I, if you're asking me, would I like um, our most capable partners to spend a few more dollars on defense? Yes. <laughs> General, today, uh, sometimes we have the impression that the generals are not with their troops. They're in a faraway place, sometimes on a different continent, hunched over a computer. Can you tell us uh, what the generals are doing as far as being close to the soldiers today? Yeah, that's a, no, that's a great question. So look, let me go back to World War One. World War One, um, that was the case. Clearly, it depends on what general you're talking. If you're talking about me, you know, my battlefield actually is Washington D.C. Right. <laughs> No, I mean, really, where that young infantryman needs me is not next to him, wherever we send him, but rather back in Washington, making sure we got the right policy for him, the right guidance, the right resources, and so forth. I mean, when you get to a certain level, your responsibility is less about down and more about up. But that said, let me assure you that the, those generals that we select to be in the, in the tactical commands, division commanders, they're out there constantly. Gary Valesky, the commander of the 101st Air Assault Division out of Fort uh, Campbell, Kentucky, has his division inside of Monrovia, Liberia, and that's where he is. He's not hunched over a, a laptop sitting back in Clarksville, Tennessee. He's in Monrovia, Liberia, as is Paul Funk, the commander of the 1st Infantry Division in Baghdad. And when I commanded the 1st Armor Division in Baghdad, and Pete Corelli was there, and Ray Odierno, and Dave Petraeus, and... and uh, uh, several others, John Batiste. You know, we, we did, every day we did a thing called battlefield circulation. The truth is, though, those young captains don't actually like to see us show up, frankly. 
And they don't like to see you show up because, you know, they got to worry about, you know, if I show up on the battlefield in Baghdad or in a neighborhood in Baghdad, which I did, you know, frankly, the captain says, oh, boy, isn't this a rare opportunity to, uh, you know, to show the old man what I got? I mean, frankly, we, you know, we worked through all that. But we did battlefield circulation constantly. This kind of conflict, the kind that I've just described to the Canadian ambassador, where you've got um, and you know and uh, and you know kind of a shadowy enemy living among the population using terror as a tactic, the guys that actually and gals that actually get that task accomplished are captains and uh, master sergeants and their troops. You know, and so one of the things we've learned over the course of time is to decentralize authority and responsibility. So I would suggest to you that a, an 05 Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Commander today probably has more capability, more responsibility, and more authority than I did when I was a two-star general 10 years ago. So that aspect of leadership you described is absolutely alive and well. We know that we've got to be out there to be seen so that we gain the trust of our subordinates. Um, but boy, those subordinates are incredible. What I actually worry about is when you take them out of that environment, bring them back to the United States, and then you do have the general kind of hovering over top of them after they haven't had that kind of oversight for some time. It sometimes can be frustrating for them. But we're doing fine in terms of leadership. Sir, thank you once again for a wonderful visit to the Carnegie Museum. Right. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.